I think there's great hope and promise in the future of precision medicine. If you think about it, health is one of the most opportunistic opportunities we have in society today because it underpins all of fundamental human features that are good. We do sick care, not health care, meaning people normally go to a doctor when they're ill, not when they're healthy. And so we've got to change all that. For me, this idea of putting people at the center is more than just ticking a box or even maybe putting somebody on an advisory board. In the previous chapters of this documentary, we explored precision medicine and its importance in healthcare. We also learned about the tools and technologies transforming precision medicine, including next generation sequencing, spatial biology, antibody discovery, organoids, and flow cytometry. In this final segment, we'll cover the move toward more proactive, data-driven, and collaborative healthcare, as well as the challenges and future of the field. I think what I'm really excited about now is for the first time in my career, I can see that this idea of data-driven health, of genomics and phenomics, has really reached a tipping point where when I give lectures in most hospital systems and other organizations, people will come up and say, that's so obvious. Why aren't we moving toward it? After decades of building the tools of genomics and systems biology, Dr. Hood now sees a future where health is preventive, wellness-focused, and continuously informed by data. And the approach that we're taking is to do a complete genome analysis, the uh, source code of life, basically, together with longitudinal phenome analyses that let us assess your phenotype as you go from an infant to an adult and, and finally die. You change in many ways. Currently leading a nonprofit named Phenome Health, Dr. Hood is pursuing this vision of data-driven health by focusing on the phenome. This is the complete set of an individual's observable and measurable traits that reflect the interaction of their genes, behavior, and environment, and that continuously change over time. And the phenome impacts you in two incredibly important ways. One, your behavior, your diet, your exercise, your sleep, your stress, all of those. And two, it impacts you with regard to the environment in which you live. And so putting the genome together with these aspects of the phenome gives us deep insights into your health trajectory and how to optimize it. Dr. Hood plans to shift medicine from treatment to prevention through a 10-year, million-patient genome phenome project that uncovers health insights, track disease transitions, and cut costs by moving testing into the home. What if in a 15 year period, we could do away with more than 50% of those chronic diseases? You're talking about saving literally trillions of dollars in the healthcare system that could then be refocused on wellness and prevention and giving everybody the kind of quality data that they really do deserve. This new system would also change the way we traditionally approached healthcare. The really key point that, and it's the failure of the contemporary disease-focused healthcare system, is for almost all diseases, we wait until they have clinically diagnosed disease. And that means the process is very complicated. And what it tends to do with a lot of pharma companies, they're very good at producing drugs that deal with symptoms but they don't get at basic causes. So it means you're not necessarily going to cure uh, the disease with a simple drug. I think we think of disease as a low-hanging fruit for precision medicine, right? I mean, that we should address the immediate problem in front of us. But then a lot of people have started to think about what if we had a more holistic view around health? Would we get to the point where people had disease? We think this is the future medicine to collect data on you and catch things before symptoms appear because then you can treat them, you can manage them and keep them healthy versus waiting for them to get sick and then try and fix them. That's very, very hard to do, especially in the area of cancer. I'm really skeptical of 
people who use cancer precision medicine as the gold standard of what we've done. And I think it's merely the optimization of the treatment of symptoms rather than causes. And it's exactly what's wrong with healthcare today. Once you hit late stage cancer, it's almost impossible to reverse. So again, this is we think the power of deep data dies, and that's where genomics fits in. I think genomics is one part of that whole thing. We can make predictions about cancer, heart disease, other things, that's just simply not possible with the way we do medicine today. And that's why we have to move to wellness and prevention and away from the disease focus. And of course, today, all the money in healthcare virtually is made when you operate on a disease patient. There's very little incentive for wellness or any incentive for prevention and everything. That has to be fundamentally changed. The focus on health, if we start there instead of waiting until we have some symptom or sign or phenotype and have to treat it, uh, would be really useful. Proactive health means we can stay ahead of disease and use data to act sooner. For this approach, Dr. Snyder acknowledges the advancement of wearable monitoring technologies. The smartwatches, the rings, that can follow your physiology continuously in real time. That is so powerful because when you're following yourself 24-7, 365 days a year, it's easy to see your baseline and see shifts from that baseline when your health is off. So the wearables have been super powerful. They're also very inexpensive, relatively speaking. By tracking his baseline closely, Snyder's devices have helped him detect subtle changes that signaled early signs of Lyme disease and COVID, which then allowed him to treat them quickly. An analogy I like to use is that monitoring health is much like monitoring your car's health. Every car has sensors on it. You have gas gauge, speedometers, but you have check engine lights, which have many gauges behind that. And all that information is relayed to your dashboard where you get to see what's going on. We need the same thing for people's health, meaning if they're wearing sensors, they could see what's going on. A red alert goes off, uh, you know, maybe trivial, maybe not be, but you can go follow up and get it checked. But if we have that going off before symptoms appear, I think we can keep people healthier a lot longer. At the Genetic Alliance, Sharon Terry has her own way of helping people take an active role in their health. Genetic Alliance is a coalition, an alliance, of about 2,000 patient advocacy groups and about 8,000 other organizations like universities and policy shops and government agencies and so forth. And our mission really is to figure out how do we put people in the center of medicine and health and research which I know is a very fashionable thing to do these days, but Genetic Alliance was founded in 1986 to do that work. Over the years, the organization has built shared platforms, registries, and biobanks to accelerate research across thousands of diseases. This has led to the development of community-driven approaches where patients, families, and advocacy groups are true partners in science and clinical trials. Our focus really is how do we transform health by empowering people to get in the game. I'm looking at things like how do we make information from people more accessible in collective ways that will give us better answers to both how do we live a healthier life as well as how do we get better if we get sick. Today, their work is advancing precision medicine toward a more collective future where communities shape research, health data is shared, and equity is built into every stage of care. And so I'm very interested in not just having the sort of top down, let me give you a seat at the table, uh, more interested in, I'm gonna build the table, I might invite you to the table, I'm gonna be deciding the menu, and how do we together work as partners through and through. While people are finding ways to contribute their own data and solutions, making that information useful has been a difficult task. This is changing with the rise in artificial intelligence. I think what we're gonna find is that increasingly, we will use AI not to replace scientists, but to make the worst parts of their job easier and easier, to make data more reliable, to make interpretation more clear, and to give us the kind of guidance we need to do the work successfully and quickly. We actually have new ways of analyzing genomes with AI. So for example, we can 
look for the genetic basis of some diseases, one called ALS, very debilitating disease, there were seven genes known. We found 690 genes using AI. So it's a much, much thorough way of, of analyzing genomes. We can combine other information in that actually makes our risk predictions, we think, a lot more powerful. Uh, AI is also going to be really important in returning information back to folks. We're also using artificial intelligence to help us interpret the results that we're getting. If we find a cell type that's interesting, we use AI to connect it to the literature, to actually go and do the mining, and to build out the networks that are important to understand how important this cell type is in a particular setting versus in another disease setting. These AI tools are also being directly integrated into healthcare. The idea that we have for AI in the future is that you'll actually have physicians be partners with the AI because what it will have the ability to do in the future is to take the enormous complexity that comes from your genome and its integration with your various phenomic features and distill that down for each individual to a series of prioritized actionable possibilities, each of which will let you improve wellness and or avoid disease. Precision medicine still has a lot of hurdles to overcome before it can reach its full potential. Ultimately, understanding the mechanism of disease is about understanding what happens in every individual patient. There's the challenge of understanding those disease processes and the challenges that are associated with doing the clinical research associated with that. There are the challenges that are associated with the regulatory aspects of this, developing a test that can be reliably used and approved for use on individuals. And then there's the element of inserting that into the broader healthcare system so that the costs remain reasonable. So the number one challenge in this whole space, whether it's genomics or big data, is who pays. Right now, we don't pay anyone to keep people healthy. In fact, it's disincentivized. We do sick care, not health care, meaning people normally go to a doctor when they're ill, not when they're healthy. And so we've got to change all that. How do we persuade patients, physicians, healthcare leaders, healthcare industrial leaders? How do we persuade regulators, FDA and so forth, regulators of the physicians' professions. And finally, how do we persuade politicians that uh, this is something that we ought to do? My own view is you should actually get paid to wear a smartwatch. You should get paid to get your genome sequenced because you're actually going to keep yourself healthier with that information. Healthcare should be 4P. It should be predictive, preventive, personalized and participatory. And the first three, prediction, prevention, and personalization, they're all science and technology, and we basically know how to go about doing that. But the fourth P is the enormous challenge. I think the biggest challenges in precision medicine are not about the science or the technology anymore. I think it's about the people, and the people in the sense of, well, who's controlling the data? from what we're learning, both the technical data as well as the people end of the data. So I think that's one place that the more collaborative sharing we can have, the better off we're gonna be. We're gonna learn quicker, faster. I think another challenge for precision medicine is the incentivization of more collaborative systems, more partnerships. And it's not the way that medicine traditionally has been incentivized. In today's system, Data often remains siloed in universities and companies focused on quick financial returns rather than collaboration. Terry argues real progress requires systemic changes, such as pooling research data and shifting incentives away from short-term profits. But the incentive is not there because this kind of shift is going to take a while, and the investors are not going to get an ROI like Lickety Split. It's going to be uh, years and years before we see a change. Even with these obstacles, many experts believe the changes needed for precision medicine to succeed are already on the horizon. The reason for hope is that on the one hand, we have all of this information that we as scientists are generating about patient samples. And then on the other hand, we have the model that the patient-doctor interaction really is an individual precision interaction. And so we have all of the elements to do precision medicine on a grand scale and do it successfully.
And so that's the hope that we'll be able to put all of that together. They're just a wealth of really exciting opportunities and people are starting to realize the world is going to change in a fundamental way. And I think we'll start seeing realignments. We're slowly seeing in small companies and health companies uh, realignments and thinking along these lines. We want people to live long, healthy lives uh, and not live, you know, healthy for a while and then go in this phase where they're really struggling for, to be honest, these days people struggle for about 10 to 15 years before they pass away. They're in uh, generally a very unhealthy state. And the goal, quite frankly, is that people live very, very healthy lives and quite then, you know, hate to say it, but pass away. But that would be a better way to go than live healthy for less time and struggle for the last 15 years. That's what we're trying to change, extend people's health span.